Um, thank you all for coming. The first thing to say is that due to unforeseen circumstances, Clover Lee will not be here this evening and David Erdman will give the lecture alone. And the second thing to say is that among his many titles and positions and achievements, uh, David is the Director of Public Programs for the Department of Architecture at the University of Hong Kong. That is to say, he's in charge of a lecture series just like this one uh, here at USJ. And he's famous for his introductions, uh, long, detailed, uh, articulate preambles to the presentation of the guest speaker. They're often more informative and more clearly argued than the actual lecture that follows. So I'm not even going to try and compete. I'm going to be brief, and I'm going to let David speak for himself. And more to the point, I'm going to let the work of David and Clover speak for itself. And I think this is really a key issue, because in a, in a time when so many architects will latch on to uh, themes external to architecture, let's say, uh, related but external, sustainability, community, heritage, social issues, and so on, as alibis for the designs, the work of David Clover's is medium specific, that is to say, their architecture, whether built or unbuilt, comprises research into the nature and the potentials of the discipline of architecture itself. They take as their themes the primordial fundamental aspects of architecture, of buildings, form, space, light, material, and above all, mass, the physical, sculptural manifestation of architecture as a material presence in the world. Now, I don't mean to suggest that David Clovers ignores the importance of wider social and environmental issues, only that they understand that architects must operate first and foremost through the medium of architecture in its most essential sense. Now, David did his undergraduate studies at Ohio State University under the famed theorist Jeffrey Kipnis, then his postgraduate studies at Columbia University as part of the earliest group of digital innovators gathered around the uh, figure of Greg Lynn, David's the recipient of many awards, including the prestigious Rome Prize, which allowed him to be in residence at the American Academy in Rome in 2008-2009, where he pursued his research into avant-garde architectural form by studying the work of the Renaissance masters. He has taught at UCLA, at Rice University in Texas, at UC Berkeley in California, uh, and at the University of Michigan. And since 2010, he's been an assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong. Now, parallel to his teaching, in 1999, he co-founded an innovative group practice called Servo and continued working there until 2006. Then in 2007, David Erdman and Clover Lee founded David Clovers. David Clovers is not a person like Pink Floyd or Monty Python. It just sounds like a person, but it's a group of people. Uh, originally based in Los Angeles and now are based in Hong Kong. Their collaboration in, combines 15 years of experience in residences, interiors, and exhibitions. Their projects emphasize architectural massing and material effects. They combine digital mod modeling, prototyping, and fabrication with standard construction methods each project integrating basic elements like ceilings, windows, lighting, and structure in unique ways so as to affect space, program, and inhabitation. So this evening, David will describe how their studio has been exploring innovative methods of massing through 11 recent projects. He'll focus on two aspects of massing as it relates to pressurizing architectural space by treating the phrase mass production as the literal production of mass. He will outline how digital, digital and physical modeling and fabrication processes pressurize the high contrast between materials, programs, and geometries in their work. And he'll contextualize this within the pressures of de designing architecture in Asia and elsewhere. Thank you, David. Tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit, I'll, I mean, Thomas kind of set it up. Um, in terms of what, how I'm going to break down the lecture, there's basically going to be two parts. Um, the idea of being under pressure, I mean, I think in the 90s and 2000s, there was an obsession with smoothing out differences, both in terms of digital design and architecture culture. Um, Clover and I both come from very different backgrounds, and a lot of, uh, at least in our practice, the idea is that the space between our differences is really where the most interesting stuff um, happens. Uh, and, and that is the pressure of the practice kind of pressing down upon us to produce that. And so unlike maybe other collaborations which are trying to present themselves as having a uniform ideology, we actually play up the differences between ourselves as an advantage as a practice. It brings different perspectives to how we work. Um, also in terms of how we work in Hong Kong, uh, we came here from LA. Um, we're very modeling intensive. We still make prototypes. This is a prototype 
that we did with DuPont Corian for our storefront in our studio in Hong Kong. We still make all of our models in the studio, uh, do all of our own renderings in the studio, and we're very involved on site. You can see Clover in the upper right-hand corner doing a drawing for a contractor on a wall um, on the site. We, we believe that while architecture still owes tremendously to notation and drawings, um, there's a lot to be learned from prototyping and modeling. And doing that, nothing beats doing that yourself or the expertise leaves the practice. And so a lot of our, the way that we've worked has been to develop esoteric methods of construction and modeling that allow us to do certain things in the projects. And that's why we do these things in house still and don't um, uh, kind of ship them out to other firms to make models. We learn as much from those models as anybody else. And so we feel the need to make them. Um, Mass production, as Thomas alluded to, is really for us, uh, one might think about mass production as the propensity to speed up architecture. The project of mass production, if you look at Gideon or modernism in general, is about making architecture quicker. It's modernizing it, trying to get its construction processes to adapt to the flows of economies and nation and city building that are happening in the contemporary world. Um, for us, Mass production is really about, um, in a sense, how to, uh, how to slow that down. Um, we're looking, and the idea of pressurizing that, while we use a lot of equipment, we use a lot of robotics, we use a lot of digital technology, which is involved with speeding up architecture, the effects are more pressurized, or what we call pressurized. And this is part of what I will try to explain in terms of mass production. So mass production for us has more to do with the production of mass rather than the traditional sense of the term mass production, although they're not unrelated in our, in our work. Uh, certain kind of a constellation of points forms this idea in our practice. One of them has to do with geometry. These are uh, a series of diagrams that uh, were done in the 19th century. Uh, uh, that are looking at the relationship of topology and algebra. What we found fascinating about these is most designers who are currently working using Rhino or Maya or 3D Studio, whatever they're working with, they're looking mostly at this surface back here. They're modeling and trying to design that surface. Uh, however, if you know your math uh, and your geometry, then you would know that there's a bunch of invisible, what are called bounding boxes, that surround those surfaces that discipline them in a number of ways, allow you to cut them and organize them into planar elements um, and more complex secondary and tertiary geometries. For us, it's the relationship between these two that's interesting. And in our practice, we try to look at how both of these have an equal potential to be materialized. So massing for us is not the not the boundary on the perimeter, nor is it the surface in the interior. It's the friction of both of those spinning inside of one another at the same time. This was an idea that, that has evolved in the research that we've been conducting over the years. Certainly the time that we spent in Rome was very important in terms of looking at this, looking at four major canons of architecture very promiscuously across a number of different times. Um, but probably the, the single most important idea that came out of that, that captures this idea, is an idea that a, a 19th century art historian introduced when he was describing the Renaissance and Baroque architecture. It's a term called immuring, I-M-M-U-R-I-N-G. And what's fascinating about it he, is he uses it to describe how columns relate to walls. Traditionally in architecture, you have pilasters, where the wall erases the column. And you have colonnades, which where the columns, the structure floats in front of the wall. A mirroring, in this particular case, is Boromini's San Carlo al Quattro Fontane. A mirroring is when a column is two thirds impacted in a wall, so the column agitates the wall. What's interesting about this ontologically is that you can no longer separate the wall or the column, and yet both are distinctly different. Uh, and this, to us, is a is exactly the kind of pressur pressurization we're talking about. Somehow they're interlocked, but there's a high degree of difference. I can still see the column, I can still see the wall, but I can't really extricate one from the other. Um, 
the first projects that we developed, and, and Wolflin has some interesting terms for this. They're very psychoanalytical. It's about frustration, vibration. He talks about the columns being imprisoned. Um, there's a sense of this kind of tension, uh, which is evident in our practice in terms of how both of us work and is also evident in the, in the work that we're trying to do, um, both between materials and between geometries. The first, when Clover and I were exploring whether or not we were going to work together, we started by doing this competition. This was for a series of artist studios in Beijing. And we were looking at how the studios would relate to the plinth. And this really became an exercise for us in how to, I'm not going to go into this project in detail, but it became an exercise for us in how to begin to think about modeling in different ways than we had both been working separately or had been trained in terms of digital modeling. And also began to introduce some of the concepts of massing that we're still working with in most of our current work. A lot of this had to do with how bounding boxes would translate into two-dimensional and three-dimensional geometries and how those would begin to work in and out of one another. The way this plays out in some of our current projects um, is really the difference between <clears throat> how we're thinking about interior masses and exterior masses or masses with different kinds of mat materialities. Um, this is the first project that we completed in Hong Kong uh, and it was a very interesting um, uh, and challenging project for a number of reasons. Um, it's an existing structure. Um, the client uh, originally, there's six of these units, and the client owned this unit and asked us to develop a design for it. And kind of jokingly with him as we were working our way through the design, we started noticing that he wanted to do a lot of things that didn't fit, and we said, well, you should buy the unit next door. And he did actually buy the unit next door and kept the exact same timeline for the project. So we had to scramble, redesign the project, and essentially think about how you can take a structure that's purpose-built for two separate buildings and make it somehow have the perception that it is one project. And there's no way to do that without absorbing a lot of difference in the project. He also wanted had very different ideas about what would happen on different floors. Um, to the extent that if you look at these two plans, you might think that they're designed by completely different architects. This plan is a free plan. This is the Piano Nobile, the first floor. This plan is more of a courtyard plan, more of a Victorian plan. And these kinds of differences we were talking about in the studio in terms of how do you play these up and allow these differences in program to begin to operate together as a cohesive project. Uh, and the way we did this was basically we started thinking about the project in section and understanding a way that we could introduce <clears throat> three masses that are kind of within the total perimeter of the project or within the exterior mass uh, of the building. And so these three masses are, are each given a different material. This is uh, slatted wood, this is solid wood, this is solid stone, and they're all attached to staircases. So they're in the kind of most transitional moments of the building. The idea was to think about ways that these, would, that these would begin to affect the overall space. In other words, these never touch, so this is not necessarily about continuity. Um, it's about how these three things are interacting within the perimeter that produces some kind of cohesion. And uh, it kind of slips out to the exterior. You get hints of it in the rear of the building. And the idea was as you move upstairs, this becomes more three-dimensional. So it starts much more two-dimensional, concealing beams, existing beams. It was doing a lot of work for us to hide mechanical engineering and plumbing, concealing lighting. And then as it moves upward, it becomes more three-dimensional. In other words, it starts moving and deviating from the perimeter quite a bit more. Part of the idea of this was to kind of pinch this in a way that it would start to activate the space around it. So it's almost as if the light is pressing down upon it or the space that's adjacent to it is pressing in on it. Uh, and you get that sensation of compression or pressurization in the space. It was also about the interactivity of the space, how it changes as you move up through it, all of these masses you're moving through, and how it would work with lighting. One of the things that we studied in very early study models and began working with in this was the projection of the shadow of the fins 
and how that would start playing off of the walls. So throughout the course of the day, this will change from something that's very ambient, uh, almost kind of ghostly uh, and very light. It becomes much, much heavier. It has a kind of zebra-like effect around uh, one or two. And this is on a sunny day. If you have a more diffuse day, this will change. And then in the evening, you get mixtures of color and different ideas about almost stratospheres um, happening in the building. This idea we applied to the two other parts of the building, the screening room, which is downstairs, which is uh, ceilings, wood, and uh, sorry, sorry, ceilings, floor, and walls are all wood. Here the openings again allow lighting in, so there's some sense that the walls have light behind it that's kind of filtering into the space. Uh, and finally, we tried to think about how this would interact with the perimeter of the building. Um, we, were, we had to put on a completely new facade on the front and the back and integrate a lot of plumbing. You can see vents, lighting, and other things. That thickness became critical to us, not only for providing shade and integrating a number of technical things, but also in terms of thinking about views out. Uh, we started playing with the window sills here. They kind of flipped down. And the idea of this is it's almost as if those, that, all of that intensity on the inside is kind of pulling the facade uh, inward. That also does some interesting things in the bedrooms where you lose the edge of the sill. It almost looks like it disappears underneath you. Um, I'm now going to show you four projects that we did with the same contractor and three of the four we did with the same client. Um, the school was with a different client. Um, and this I think kind of shows how we work through research, but also how a body of ideas start to um, transform in our work. Uh, this is in the mid-levels in Hong Kong. Uh, and this, this project is a two-story, 4,000 square foot um, uh, residential uh, unit. Uh, it had some exterior work and a lot of interior work. And the, the pr problem with this unit and we always try to turn our problems into an advantage, was really this central space. This is a core that originally in the design, this was closed off from the entry. So you, there was no connection to the upstairs. This is the city view and the harbor view here. This is the mountain and the peak view on this side of this unit. And they were, to, some, to a large extent, kind of blocked off from one another. So this project and a number of our projects you'll see but this was really the first one starts to explore the relationship between wood and plaster as two different media or substances that would have kind of different speeds the wood in a sense holds the plaster into position and what we were trying to do here is by opening up that area back here using these edges basically produce effects that would reach across the space at bigger distances without actually having to fill it with stuff. So this is a way of kind of building up a pressure um, between geometries without, again, without them actually touching and between different high contrast materials. In the, in the core, we loaded it with a lot of artificial lighting and a lot of texture. So that's a way of giving it more verticality, opening it up, and then as you move out into the, on the ground floor into the dining room and the living room, it becomes a bit more lateral, reaching out to the views. The stair is really the centerpiece that begins to tile up all of this together. It pulls the flooring up to the upstairs and begins to think about how, a, how we could really uh, activate the vertical dimension, the z-axis of the apartment, um, not only in how it's modeled. The stair was existing, but we re reconstructed it um, using glass fiber reinforced concrete. This was all developed using computer models built on wax molds in Shanghai, shipped to Hong Kong in a number of pieces and then installed, uh, only to produce really a sense in the space that you're leaking the space from downstairs to upstairs. And there were a number of different things happening here. One is that you get the flooring moving down. We're using the lighting that's kind of coming from the top and the bottom to, in a sense, make a light chimney here. And then also working with two-dimensional and three-dimensional effects in the ceiling, similar to what we were doing in the lower floors. So the lighting is very bright on the edges of the ceiling. It diminishes and becomes more three-dimensional and object-like here. These are ways of taking things that are very different, that have to do a lot of different work, and thinking again about how they're kind of affecting one another without necessarily touching. 
A second project we did for the same client, again, this is wooden plaster, uh, uh, looked at how we could take some of those ideas and think about it between the ceiling and the floor. In a sense, what we did here was inserted a mass within the apartment, and we're looking at how those two could kind of press in upon one another to really deal with a number of issues. Um, this is a very typical kind of Hong Kong building. I don't know if they're the same here in Macau, but there's a tremendous amount of core walls that cannot be knocked down in this building. Um, there's a lot of mechanical systems running through the chases here that we couldn't touch and a lot of structural areas that were huge. Um, and in the original apartment, when you walked in, you basically walked into this door, into this wall, and then there was a door leading you into this room. So it was almost, it was very broken, broken down. And we were trying to figure out ways that we could make relationships between the entry and the main living space, figure out how we could kind of bend you into the apartment, and also use um, the differences between the materials and the thicknesses that we had to absorb to absorb a number of the mechanical systems to kind of press down on the space and compress it in areas and open it up in others. So it gives you a sense of the space. It's almost like designing without walls, just designing with the roof and the floor and thinking about how the ceiling could produce very subtle uh, divisions between space and between zones. Um, this was had a lot of technical constraints, which we always embrace. And, and instead of seeing them as our enemy, try to turn them into design features. So you can see how a lot of the shaping is tied to the structure. In a sense, what we're doing here is we're pressurizing things that architects normally wouldn't care about. They would do a flat ceiling or an open ceiling like this and let all of those systems run through freely. We actually had to pull that stuff much closer to the beams and squeeze it into a much tighter space in order to open up these other spaces. So it's a kind of counterintuitive idea about pressurizing things to release pressure in other areas of the building. And you can see a bit of how that works here and how we were playing with that massing. Uh, and it, areas like the entry become kind of very interesting for us, complex knots where the wood flips up and becomes the ceiling. You're getting uh, wood moving across multiple surfaces. You have lighting, you have storage, you have uh, infrastructure all kind of coming together and hooking together in this one uh, area. Here you can see both of them together. The way that we did this, we started developing not only ways of modeling that dealt with the fall of wood and how you work with ruled surfaces, but also specific techniques with our contractor. The contractor was a cabinet maker, um, and we started thinking about how these could be built off-site. The ceilings are prefabricated in Guangzhou. You can see how precise they had to be these rub right up against the AC units. Um, they're fabricated off-site, brought onto site in a number of pieces and installed. Um, and uh, we also tried to think about ways that we could work with some of these ancillary spaces in terms of how some of these ideas might pull through the whole unit. These were really treated as tubes that we started thinking about how the wood on the ceiling and the floor could kind of flip around to the walls in the kitchen. So this elongates the space and, and flips the texture, kind of something like this. If you flip this over, this is more what's happening in the living room. Uh, in the bathrooms, we started working with tile mosaics to, these were very dark bathrooms, to try to enhance the artificial and natural light coming out of the windows. So instead of thinking about the mosaic simply as a gradient of color, we're actually dialing this up so it becomes brighter toward the window. So it makes these rooms feel brighter than they actually are. So again, it's kind of playing with illusions and working with color in ways that it has spatial uh, effects. I think we're, we're always looking for the handles in a project that we can work with. And doing a school, um, schools are very low budget. Um, they're very quick. Uh, and uh, this school project, we were able to, with the same contractor, we were able to look at how we could combine a number of these ideas. Um, this was a very interesting client. They uh, fashioned the curriculum after a Waldorf school, so all the materials had to be natural woods. And as with, as you can imagine in Hong Kong, the, the property was very cut up. There's two classrooms proper, and then basically the rest of the property is a hallway. 
they wanted to be able to use the hallway as a classroom. They wanted to be able to break down the classrooms. And so we deployed a, basically two of the concepts we were working with in the last two projects I showed here and started looking at how they might come together. On one hand, you have a wainscoting that integrates um, furniture and storage that moves through the hallway and into the classrooms. And then you have these ceilings that uh, begin to define the classrooms. And uh, the counterpoint to them are what we call these reading pads, uh, which produces a diagonal in the classroom. This is a way of thinking about a classroom that can do two things at once. It has a soft area. Kids lie on this and lean back on it. And then a more raised area for the teaching zone. The wainscoting integrates things like uh, pegboards for the students, benches, uh, shelving. Uh, and the lighting, uh, which is a, a exposed lighting in the hallway, kind of uh, introduces a texture in between those areas. So the idea was really that you would have this, this mass coming up from the floor and then these masses installed over the top of these and the zone in between was an area of pressurization. The, the clients, and we were very excited about the fact that the students really had to learn from the architecture. So there were ideas about how you get under the architecture, play on the architecture, and use it in a number of different ways. And that's what drove a lot of these ideas about cork boards starting up high for teachers, moving their way down for kids so they can interact with them in different ways. This is actually a climbing wall. I don't think kids would actually climb up here <laughs> unless they're really ballsy, but um, you know, the idea was how those kinds of patterns would work their way around and play with the space and encourage students to interact with the architecture uh, in different ways. This went as far as how we thought about the signage, which kind of peels under and wraps into the space uh, and becomes uh, kind of the moment of entry where they all take off their shoes when they enter in the morning. Um, the fourth project we did with this, this client uh, was the first um, multi-unit project that we did. This is a four-unit, four-story project uh, in Stanley Beach. Um, the client originally wanted to knock down this building, and this, this project was really for us a study, a very careful study on how you could do adaptive reuse in new ways. Um, we encouraged the client and convinced them to keep this building. We, we thought it had... Uh, some kind of slightly Miesian, Tugendhat-like uh, elements to it. These fins in particular we were, we were very curious about, but it's much more kitschy. It has brick, it has river rock. But most importantly, this is really known in Stanley as a building. A lot of people who've lived in Hong Kong for a long time know this building. It's a kind of feature above St. Stephen's Beach. And it would be quite volatile to introduce a big development development here. So we tried to think about strategies that could kind of tailor and alter the existing building, which really was a story of accumulation. The, the building originally only had two units, these two. This was a changing room downstairs to go to the beach originally, and the penthouse on the top was just a roof deck originally. So all of the, the ways that the building was being used was really you had awnings, air conditioning units, plumbing, a whole bunch of random stuff just kind of attached to the building. And so we suggested to them, well, we should pull all of that off, actually design a building core in the building through the stairwell, restore the facade to its original condition, and think about how the stairwell and the gardens can become features and very strong common areas that give the building assets that other similar buildings in Hong Kong don't have. So the first kind of area of attack, and this is somewhat surgical, is the stairwell, which originally the treads were mahogany and the doors were mahogany in this. So we kind of exaggerated the wood-like character of this stairwell. We added more wood to it and started thinking about how it could move its way to the exterior and kind of work its way into the interior up and through the stairwell. So this is new wood here. You can see the mixtures of existing parquet flooring and then the new mahogany. And then eventually how these would burrow into the units and where, they, where, they where the wood locks into the units opened up the entries of the units. So for instance, in the penthouse, when you entered it originally, there was a wall here and we pulled that out. And so the wood comes in and it kind of grabs the unit, organizes 
doors organizes storage. Um, and when we, when we did this, we noticed it also exposed the column, which provided an interesting opportunity for us in terms of design and how we could think about how the wood here would work with the plaster in ways differently than in some of our other projects. And so here the idea of pressurization is that this pinch at the entry, the wood actually, the space between the wood and the column starts to kind of agitate the column. I don't know if this makes sense, but the way Clover and I were imagining this is it almost makes the space more of a mass than either the plaster or the wood because it feels like the space is twisting the column because it's so tight uh, in that space. Uh, and we compressed the entries uh, similarly in the other units, and you'll see there's similar work happening in the columns um, in these units that begins to think about ways that we could engage that entry and also deal with shrapnel of the existing structure. Other designers might just have a column there, which might seem out of place. We were trying to make the column, in a sense, be different, but yet feel like it was intended to live in that spot in the project. A lot of this also, as I mentioned, was about opening things up. This unit, uh, you similarly walked in to a doorway. The kitchen was closed off. This was a way of pulling the kitchen out, opening up views immediately to the outside, pulling the kitchen out and into, uh, and into the living space. So there was a lot of other work that using this material and thinking about how it leaks into the, into the apartments started to organize. Um, the second system that kind of snakes its way around the perimeter was a stone system. This wraps the terrace of the, of the, uh, of the penthouse on the top, kind of wraps around like this, and wraps the lowest unit and the gardens that are shared. What we tried to do here was there was there's a slight alteration in the west wing of this unit. So the stone starts as a vertical wall. It grabs this addition. And we use the stair to think about how this could kind of work its way out and grab the garden. This allowed us to open up patio space for this unit that's to the right here and also segregate circulation for the garden. Again, we're kind of have a, have a pinch point here that opens up to and grabs pieces of the garden below. And upstairs, it's kind of wrapping around and enclosing this penthouse space. Here you can see that column and wood in the interior uh, again. The ground floor unit was the first, we were originally asked to just design this unit and then everybody moved out of the building and they asked us to design the entire building. And so it's really the most esoteric. And because it was originally the changing rooms, it was also really the underbelly of the building and presented a whole number of issues for us. What we tried to do in this unit, originally when you came in, there was a wall here, the bedrooms were here. Uh, so you couldn't see out to the sea. We kind of pushed the bedrooms to the sides, that exposed these two columns, but it also exposed this horribly messy ceiling of uh, beams and uh, mechanical uh, infrastructure. And what we did was we kind of played with that to develop a coffer system that would poke, kind of poke holes up and into that, into the gaps between the beams. So in a sense, we kind of messed it up more by adding more beams, and similar with the stairwell, instead of trying to change the mahogany, we added more. Here we, we added more beams to give it this effect. Um, these, of course, are fantastic ideas when you start with them, and then you realize they have a tremendous amount of difficulty implementing themselves because, again, you're shaping all of the infrastructure in very unique ways. We were also very interested in making this very soft and feel very quilt-like, so it's almost as if the lights are pressing in uh, on the ceiling itself. Um, this required, and I show this because your students, for you to think about, you know, how when you're thinking about these ideas, the kind of commitment that it takes to develop these kinds of designs, we had to chart out all the beams, work out all of the MEP, model all of it so that we could figure out how large these were, standardize the coffers, work with the developers to develop prototypes of those, and then finally play around with it on site um, to implement it. It's a great process, and I think working in Hong Kong and in Asia is fantastic because, again, you're, you start with drawings and ideas, and then you're on site working these things out, and you can use the site in many ways to, um, to develop the projects. The final project that I'll show in the mass production 
uh, portion of the lecture is Butterfly House, which is a project that we're working on right now in upstate New York. It is under construction. It's for two artists in New York City. And, it, it, and I position this last because it starts to introduce the concept of mass media, which I'll outline after I show this project. Mostly what this project um, is doing is it's trying to, instead of traditional homes, which are trying to uh, understand the landscape as something that flows through the house or a pavilion that flows under the roof, we're trying to kind of pull the landscape into the house, and I'll explain some of the ways that we're doing this. It's on a beautiful 22-acre lot in upstate New York. This is where uh, the two studios for the husband and wife artists are. They stay in this house, and this is a butterfly house, which is located near this pond. Both of the ponds are artificial, and it's in kind of a bowl. It's a kind of a crater, which you'll see on the site. They're artists, they're painters, they're very into color. We'd spent some time on the site, and you're going to see in this video, this is a cloud passing over. There are a bunch of effects that happen on the site. The trees almost look like they're lighting up here. Um, this is in peak fall, and this is, this is all done with natural lighting. This is not a film trick, but we, Clover and I became fascinated with these kinds of ideas about how you interact with the landscape because on one hand, they feel very artificial, almost theatrical. We call them preternatural, almost not of the world. And this is part of why we call it Butterfly House. We're trying to work with color and the landscape in a very artificial way, the way that uh, butterflies that don't look like their surroundings um, work with, but they still have a bigger idea about how they work with their environment. In this particular case, the cladding, how it works throughout the seasons, it will grab color as much as it emits color uh, onto the surroundings. So the blues will make, make leaves slightly blue at certain moments, and the orange from the leaves will make uh, uh, the neutral tiles more orange at other moments. That's part of what we're doing here. And we're working the long edges of the building to kind of fold, fold the landscape in, uh, which you can see happens mostly along these two edges. So when you enter the building, you're almost immediately outside again. Um, and the idea here is that the way that we're working these edges three-dimensionally starts to give you a sense that the landscape is pulling to the interior. Just to briefly mention, the construction of the house is quite simple. It's a flipped over truss. The, the tiling system I'll show in it momentarily. It's a shingled tile, but it's stainless steel. So this works in a sense with the conventions of American house building. It just perverts them in many ways. It's kind of one door, one window, one roof, wood construction, shingle tile. The idea that it pulls the landscape in, which you can again see here in terms of how these edges work, is, is in a sense the kind of antithesis of, case, of Pierre Koenig's Case Study 22, which again is all about modernism ejecting itself into the city or the landscape of the city. Here we're trying to pull that back in. And so as you move through the building and you look laterally across it, you're kind of looking through the building a lot as much as you're looking out at the landscape. And this is part of what we mean by pulling the, the outside and capturing it in the interior. There were many ways that we were studying the curvature and the massing of the project to produce a number of different effects um, and produce a lot of difference in the building. Part of this has to do with the siting, which is very unique. You can be above the building in certain parts of the site when you're entering. Uh, which allows you to understand the roof elevation. It becomes, in a sense, the fifth elevation. It's very rare that a roof is actually part of the elevation of a building, but in this case, it's very folded and kneaded into the building. And you can also get under the building uh, when you're across the pond, which begins to grab the reflection. You can see the beginning of the grading work that we're doing here for the berm, uh, which gives it different relationships different kinds of color effects as you're moving around it, where you get reflections on the gl glass, reflections in the pond, different ways that the roof captures the space of its surroundings. Here it's kind of wrapping around the apple tree. So it's about this mass kind of, on one hand, it came to the site later, but we're trying to make it seem as if it almost generated the site to some extent or is emitting itself onto the site in a variety of ways. The graphic patterning and the, and the tiling, the, the stainless steel tiling, were a kind of a 
collaboration and obsession with the, with the clients. Um, we looked at many different ways that we could distribute the colors here and what we ended up working with is this distribution largely because the neutral colors just skip ahead oh sorry skip back uh, the neutral colors uh, are are quite interesting here what we found is if you add color to the ridges you're basically making the massing more present you're making it higher contrast with the surroundings if we use neutral color tiles, the sharp edges and crisp edges of the massing that we're designing actually diffuse at moments, and they can be heightened at other moments. So it gives them more interaction with the surroundings. And so that is what led us to this, this particular distribution as opposed to some of these other ones. In other words, it allows parts of the massing to appear and disappear depending on the season, time of, time of day, depending on how you move around it. The stainless steel tiling further adds to this. This is a mock-up we did at the studio. It's very dynamic. When you look at it straight on, you can see even some of the difference of color and the depth within the panels themselves. But here it's very gold and very blue. These are the exact same panels, but pointed at the sky. Uh, and you can see the color differences. They start to actually grab color in a variety of ways. So you can imagine when this is done, and this is an ongoing process of study, uh, with the contractor, they're about ready to start cladding it, hopefully next week. Um, uh, in terms of how we're getting uh, basically the landscape in a number of different ways to be pulled in and pressurized um, in the building, uh, which we're very excited to see. That, that idea really comes to this notion of mass media, which is the second part of the talk. And I'll move through these projects pretty quickly because most of them are design proposals and not built. Um, mass media, if you think about the term, it, it, it generally tends to have to do with things that are very ephemeral, right? It's television shows, it's things that appeal to the masses, it's publications, it's magazines, it's graphic and two-dimensional content. We don't generally think of architecture as mass media. We think of architecture as something more permanent, institutional, and having a deeper cultural value. We don't necessarily agree with that. I think contemporary practice has to contend with those differences. But one way that architecture can play with media is to actually think about it quite literally. Think about lighting, think about graphics, and think about how you can actually mass those into architecture. Uh, one way that this is done traditionally, and again, the work in Rome was very valuable to us to think about this, is the way that window openings relate to natural light. They can produce very artificial effects at moments. This is a window in the crypt of San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane and our reading on this is it's very difficult to detach the shape of the light from the shape of the window. There are similar similar uh, uh, issues uh, that one finds in some Middle Eastern mosques uh, in terms of how two-dimensional graphics work with buildings. I did research with my UCLA students over a couple of years on uh, areas where massing, relationships of massing don't work very well. There are basically moments between domes and cubes that develop difficult transitions, things called pendentives and squinches in traditional mosques in Istanbul. We went to Istanbul and what you will find, and you're looking at a squinch, these are very complicated, frustrated geometrical areas. You'll find that they're saturated with two-dimensional graphics. Now, why is that interesting or compelling? What's, they're very three-dimensional areas, but what we found interesting about these is you find areas, this is a crease in the, in the squinch, and the graphics move right across it. So in a sense, they kind of flatten it out, so they're speeding up the architecture. And then there are moments where graphics look three-dimensional, but they're actually two-dimensional. So there's a play between graphics looking two-dimensional, looking three-dimensional, but are actually two-dimensional, and two-dimensional graphics working against three-dimensional architecture. This launched a, a, is something that you can't really separate these two ideas, mass production and mass media, in our work, but they do inform a lot of it. And it launched a number of projects that we did with the artist um, C.E.B. Reese. He wrote and authored Processing, um, and we developed a, a research with DuPont and with him uh, looking at using Corian for facades. This was a house that we designed for a developer in Houston. 
The basic idea here is frescoes are typically on the interior of a building and they're on the ceiling. Here we were looking at how you could develop a fresco that is on the facade of a building. It negotiates windows and the structure of buildings and still has some of the elusive and two-dimensional qualities of, uh, of frescoes. Frescoes, of, of course, the trompe l'oeil is they, they kind of suggest an elusive space beyond themselves. A lot of the work here is dealing with artificial lighting, natural lighting, how we're dealing with two-dimensional etching and three-dimensional form work of the massing to get all the basically three different systems, two-dimensional line work, windows, and the overall massing to interplay with one another. Again, this comes back to, you can see how this might relate to a mirroring, but it more strictly is dealing with how we are trying to press the media into the architecture to slow down the media. This developed a number of esoteric techniques that we still use in our practice. We had to unroll and unfold a lot of the processing script. We developed our own interface with the artist for this. He had never worked three-dimensionally, so how this became a material set of ideas, how we could program machinery to etch the Corian, how we could unroll that into the facade became quite crucial. We did a series of full-scale prototypes for an exhibition called Emuring that we did at SciArc, really getting into how this would work. Um, and we looked at two different materials. Um, we looked at DuPont Corian and tried to play up how we could subtract from it and reveal its, its translucent qualities, as well as using glass fiber reinforced concrete and playing with how you have to, that is a convex process of forming and how you would play with light and shadow. Both of these are looking at ways that the windows, the moment of the natural and artificial lighting, would begin to agitate the overall mass and the fresco. Uh, we worked quite intensively with the factories in both cases. These are um, uh, the molds and the, and the pieces before they were shipped to Los Angeles. Uh, and worked with the students at SciArc to think about how we could install the lighting in these. What I think is the most important about this shift and vibration between 2D and 3D, how the windows and the material and the etching all work together, is a lot of people don't understand it when they see it. It's very, very difficult to understand it visually. And so a lot of people go up to it and touch it. And I think that, to Clover and I, is a testament to the fact that it's engaging other ideas of the senses. And to this, this point, I think, is, is quite important in our work in that the more you're combining difference and different elements together, the more you're layering two-dimensional and three-dimensional systems on top of one another, the more it becomes optically difficult to understand but mysterious enough to engage people in the space. So they have to engage it in other ways. They have to touch it, feel it, um, spend more time in the space to try to understand it. Um, that was something that we found in the storefront that we did. We found people rubbing this all the time when we would come into the office in the morning which was quite strange. Um, part of why DuPont Corian funded all of these projects was because of this moment here, which is very similar to the moment that I was referring to in the squinch, um, which is they couldn't figure out how to machine this, how to get over this crease. For us, what was interesting about it was the fact that it takes something which is two-dimensional and at moments makes that which is three-dimensional more two-dimensional and in other moments heightens that because of how we were cutting into the material. So again, how the daylight and artificial light begin to play off of one another, how the door worked, set up a, a whole slew of possibilities for us in terms of how we were thinking about massing media. Now, I, I'm only going to show two images of this project, but I think it's, it's important to construct the point about mass media. This was for the Taipei Pop Music Center. Um, we developed a competition proposal for this. It is a pop music center. It's basically three big venues in one. We developed three concrete masses in, inside of what is otherwise a big video screen. The idea that architecture has to display information at huge scales is becoming more and more prevalent. So the idea of mass media, while it may sound like something that's esoteric to our practice, is actually something that we firmly believe architectural practice has to negotiate in the 21st century. This, the, basically the protocol for this, uh, for this competition was how do you make a building a billboard? And so if we don't develop theories about how media becomes architectural, 
I think we're not engaging it in ways that, that could become richer to both graphic designers but also to the discipline itself. We've, of course, in some of our newer projects, looked at other kinds of media, landscape, um, other ways of working with color, water, hydrology, other aspects of building systems in terms of how we can think about how media works its way into buildings. Um, this was a proposal that we did in Guangxi, China um, uh, for uh, two parts of an eco-tourist resort. Kengo Kuma, in fact, was designing the hotel. What you're seeing here is the arrivals building. I'll talk briefly about it. The site is very rich with heritage. Um, it has this massive 100-meter cave uh, in it. The cave is flooded with water. There are very interesting and mysterious uh, lighting effects that happen as a result of this. Our project was to activate these two areas of the site. Kuma's Hotel, you can see these three kind of rocks here. That was um, his proposal for those. You would enter into our building and then be distributed onto the site to the hotel, a heritage site, or the cave over here. And the second part of, we de of what we designed is a, a um, set of waiting pools, what's called a therm, that is uh, in, front of that, uh, in front of that cave. Um, basically, the building begins to orient itself around a number of benchmarks, trees, statues, the heritage site. Um, and, and started to think about how we could pull the landscape into the site. This shares uh, some similar thinking with Butterfly House, but at a much larger scale. So we were looking at some of the focal points of the site, as well as the river, how we could orient toward them, and how we could begin pulling them in. Uh, one thing we did was we thought about how the building, in certain views, would basically kind of defer to the landscape or almost disappear, look like it's working its way into the ground. Uh, the roof is a, hair, is a um, native habitat garden um, that uh, the people who are going as tourists can visit throughout the day. Basically, the idea was that the building would kind of emerge and appear on the river at moments and disappear at other moments. We were also looking at how we could pull the infrastructure into the building. The rear end of the building is parking lots, so you can see we're pressing the roads down here to get the vehicles to disappear and capture them within the building. Pedestrians, only, pedestrians and golf carts only come out on this side. Um, there's basically, the way the building is broken down is the lower floor is where all of the main tourists who are coming to get tickets to go to the cave are collected, and they can also occupy the roof. And this middle zone is where you check in to the hotel uh, itself. That entry is you enter on foot uh, into this lobby. And the idea, really, of how these zones would interact, they weren't physically allowed to interact. The, the guests, the client was really insistent that the guests who are going to this hotel had to be absolutely segregated from all of the tourists from China who come to this site throughout the year. However, as an architectural idea, we tried to think about how they could interact with each other visually, or at least in terms of color, how they could leak into one another, how those systems might have some interface, how we could kind of pressurize that moment. And uh, media like bamboo, water, and drainage, these are wells that are very particular to the site. We had never seen these before. This is a drainage well. You can see clover here with our client. Um, we became kind of fascinated with some of the features we were finding on the site and started thinking about ways that the building could, in a sense, really work the landscape. Um, there is, in Chinese culture, some of you may know this, there are four, 46 paintings called the, the, the weaving and farming paintings. And really, they argue that Chinese landscape has always, it was always proto-modern, if you look at them. It's always been tilled, it's always been mechanized. And so the way that we developed this project was to think about a way that it would begin to, to mechanize and, and turn the landscape into an agent. It collects rainwater, distributes it, filters it back down through this pool and back out to the river. Um, that is a way of treating the water so it doesn't damage the river. It also introduces these native habitat gardens and this public area on the roof. You can see how it's kind of spongy uh, in the roof. That also begins to introduce other ways that we were working uh, with the site. Uh, 
Uh, other ways, other ideas about absorption that we dealt with was the cladding itself, which was a terracotta cladding, which was custom designed um, to grab daylight at these points, moss, and get darker at these points. This is a uh, timeline animation that we set up for this. So the shaping of the of the panels and the way that we thought about that. Sorry, I'm trying to replay this. Thought about the patina of the project also had to do with literally absorbing the oxygen of the surrounding landscape and capturing things like the reflection of the water from below in terms of how we were shaping this roof. You can see here how parts of the roof garden up above those openings begin to penetrate and you can see up and into them from the, from the lobby. And this is one of the moments where you start to get a confluence of different areas, different elements and different materials coming together at one area but not necessarily touching one another. The therm, um, we really had to build a dam in front of the cave. That's what they asked us to do, which was completely vicious, aggressive. And so we tried to think about ways that we could use some of the techniques that are currently being used in the area to let water capture it momentarily and then distribute it back out through the site and filter it in terms of how we develop this archipelago of wading pools that are in front of the changing rooms. There's an aquifer back here that feeds this area and what they originally wanted to do was just grab the water and let people swim in it and then let it feed back into the river. What we tried to do was set up basically different speeds of flows. It's very low lying. It, it, it is almost a, a podium leading up to the cave. You can see the cave in the background here. It allows for different ways that the pools can be used. There's a kind of central area that has bigger pools and then smaller tubs. These aren't small by any stretch of the means. Some of the bigger ones are probably the size of the entire library here. But it allowed us to think about ways that water could be captured, distributed, how that would distribute program, and set up different ways of using the site uh, 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 in front of the cave. The last project that I'll show is a project that we're doing just north of here. It's in Zhuhai. Um, it also has, it's in a big landscape, but it's a much more artificial landscape. It's the top of a 55 hectare parking garage. And similarly tries to think about how it can pull in parts of the landscape into the parking garage and um, work knead it into the pavilion. So again, this is the idea that the landscape, light and air are other media that you're folding into the architecture. Um, as I understand it, this project is the biggest single phase project in China. Um, at least that's what our client tells us. It is this site uh, uh, in Zhuhai. Um, it is a very conventional housing project. It comprises 46 towers. Um, and the area that we've been asked to work on is the podium. None of what you're seeing here is our design. This is all by other people. But we've been asked to develop a series of pavilions for this podium. Uh, and that sit within a larger landscape that Chris Counts, who's a ar uh, landscape architect from New York, designed, uh, as well as think about entries um, in the interior of the garage. The scale of the project, which is uh, well under construction, is really colossal. Um, this, for instance, this avenue here is basically you're looking down this lane here, and this is when the buildings are a little bit over halfway built. Now a number of them have topped out. So these are very, very tall buildings. Um, and the idea is that the, that the parking garage, the landscape on top of it, the interior of the parking garage, and these pavilions would develop a, a cultural space, a space of recreation and an urban space for the 40,000 plus inhabitants here and the public that will come here to shop um, in a way that would develop a different relationship with the landscape. There are three basic areas of scope that they asked us to look at, the entries to the parking garage, the columns in the interior of the parking garage, which is again 55 hectares, so it's quite large, and then the pavilions that sit on top. The entries themselves look at ways that they can kind of defer to the vehicular entries. They, in a sense, are pressed in. Uh, they're playing off of the roofs. I don't think that the, this part of the project is going to be built. It's still being debated whether or not this will, but you can see that we almost started treating the landscape and the retaining walls as if they're fingers 
kind of pressing into the perimeter of the site. Capturing pedestrian flows, a lot of these had people uh, in here. They have a lot of graphic signage. And we were using a terracotta system as well for this, looking at certain ideas about how it could go from something that's more blank to more textured. The podium itself, um, we started looking at, there were a number of vents that the client wants to introduce. So we started looking at ways that we could allow daylight into the garage as well as shape artificial light coming out of the garage for the inhabitants <coughs> in the towers at night that could also double as circulatory devices. You can see the pavilions here are also located in moments like that. So the pavilions in some cases land on top of these columns which look at ways that we could grow certain things in the lower depths of the garage. Um, this was, oops, sorry. Uh, this required a lot of study in terms of how the site is lit by natural lighting, how we could locate these strategically in front of the entries to buildings and daylight, which we did a lot of, I don't know if you use Echotect in the school here, but we did a lot of Echotect analysis looking at how we could shape these columns to think about how planters would work. Um, it ends up that they will be combinations of grow lamps, artificial lighting, and natural lighting in terms of how these grow. The idea, you can imagine, we basically have these entries, these pavilions, and then the interior of the garage. How do you get all of that to allow for a huge diversity of difference over 55 hectares, but also have some kind of architectural idea about it? It's a weird scale. It's almost the size of a small city, and at the same time, it's being treated as one building. Um, we looked at, and the way that we conceived of this was really I don't know if you know that aspen groves are the largest living organism in the planet. This is actually the tree. The root, what we consider the root system is the tree, and these are the branches, the actual things that we traditionally consider trees. And that's kind of how we imagine this working, that you have this perimeter um, that f works its way into the interior, produces these moments, these kind of moments of intensity in the garage that then appear again uh, on the on the top of the garage as pavilions. How you get those areas of intensity to work together was a game, became a some game of how we could work with graphics. We started looking at color in terms of how we could intensify the openings. There's an entire farm of artificial lighting that works with the columns. This is a reflected ceiling plan showing the lights. These basically produce these chandeliers that are near the entries. The lighting system in and of itself that organizes itself around these columns and planters uh, was a, is a whole project of product design for us. We had to uh, think about how we could, the planters themselves are products. They have to be customized off-site, built off-site, prefabricated off-site, integrate um, uh, grow lamps. We had to think about how they could irrigate water systems into them. And then the lighting itself Again, this is tens of thousands of lights. So we had to convince the client on one hand that he should switch to LEDs and not just use fluorescent lighting, but also think about how the lighting in combination with the planters, in combination with the, the materials, could basically do away with wayfinding signage. Um, so the idea here is that these chandeliers uh, and the moments around these columns would really begin to organize the site in specific ways. As you're looking through these columns, you would see these moments of intensity. Um, we had to do a, a, a quite a bit of analysis to see the actual performance of the lighting, how it r would rank compared to fluorescence, and also deal with how we could distribute these in more normative grids versus using a Fibonacci series uh, around the uh, chandeliers and how we would build that. The lighting itself, one of the big ways that we sold the client on this is the lighting is at a very low level when cars and people aren't in the garage, so it's at the lowest level possible. And then when cars move through it, it, it brightens. So this, again, helps you kind of find your way through the project. It also has color in it so that as you turn, you can find spaces in the garage and you'll see this changes color as you park in here. Uh, so it's a combination of strategies, columns, the entries, uh, 
how all of that works as a kind of architectural idea about signage and graphics that helps you find your way through what is otherwise a massive maze of columns uh, and lighting in, a, in the garage. The pavilions, which you can see here, there's one on the north site and eight on the south site, um, are, are kind of fashioned upon three different models. There are smaller, more intimate pavilions, which are more donut-like. These tend to burrow into the landscape a bit more intensively. You'll see the contours around these are almost as if the site itself is responding to the shape of the pavilion. Again, in this case, in working with the landscape architect, a lot of the idea here is not that the building defers to the landscape or the landscape defers to the building, but that you can't tell which one came first or how to unlock them from one another. So there's a very intimate set of relationships. These have much shorter views, these pavilions do, and they're intended for much fewer people. The second kind are more civic. These are more kind of mushroom-like. These sit on a stem. These are more open to the landscape. These are more of a traditional kind of big roof over the landscape. Um, and these have much bigger views. Generally, you're looking over much larger arrays of the, of the landscape itself, and they collect larger groupings of people. And then finally, we have uh, the pool houses. There are two of these on the site. And these are a kind of combination of the two. These have to be private because people are changing in them, so they have a more intimate side to them, a kind of rear side, and then they open up in a very big way to the pool sides uh, themselves. And you can see the two different scales of views. We've been working with Burrow Happold engineering these pavilions. Um, they're, they're basically, and this was quite a challenge to figure out how to do wood in China. These are exposed wood trusses that sit on concrete cores and have a glass fiber reinforced um, uh, concrete roof. It's basically just arrayed around the center. And you can see we built some models to discuss with them kind of how this would, could be fabricated. Uh, pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of fabricating the trusses in unique ways. Um, it's similar for the donut pavilions, but those are more of a ring beam. So instead of them being a core that hangs the trusses on them, these are trusses that are connected from the perimeter inward. And you can see uh, a number of deflection studies and structural studies we were doing with Burl Happold here. All of the pavilions, in a sense, have a, an idea about interiority. So I think similar to Butterfly House, instead of them just being open to the landscape, they're trying to develop discrete interiors. This one is obviously more interiorized than the other one, which is more extroverted. Uh, the pool pavilions, again, are a kind of combination of the two. And uh, this one is actually under construction right now. You can see the pool shape here. This is the pavilion. You can see the beginning of the footings here. This is the pool. And you can see how already the, the top part of this has not been cast yet. This was just shot on Tuesday. They just finished the concrete pour on this on, on uh, last week, and we just went to visit the site earlier this week. But you can start to get a sense of how you get these two different sides, the kind of much bigger side versus the more intimate side, and see how this begins to organize itself. These are the two stairwells going down to the changing rooms below and the walls will, uh, and the roof will come up from here. The way that these become more interiorized is it builds upon a, a much more traditional idea about Chinese pavilions, which you have these kaleidoscopic ceilings. Uh, I think tr a lot of architects try to play with the roof itself. We've been trying to play with the roof and the color and this idea about coming into pavilions and looking up. That's why they have an oculus to, again, engage that vertical axis but also why we've spent quite a bit of time looking at color um, in these pavilions. The idea is that from your apartment, and these are views from apartments, you would never see the color. You only see the glow of it on the, on the uh, pavers below, the glow or the reflection of it itself. It's only when you're moving around the site that you would discover the color of these pavilions. Uh, the way we're doing this, we looked at a number of coloring strategies, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, what we're doing is we're playing with gradient colors of gradient ideas of color 
by coloring the, the three chords differently. We can get them to shift to some extent, become more yellow, become more gold as you move around them. Um, this has been the most developed in this, in this uh, pavilion uh, because this is the one that is currently under construction. They'll, they're starting sequentially. Uh, and what we have done is basically worked with four colors, and you can start to see how it shifts from green to purple back to green here. Work with four colors in terms of how we're distributing this. The idea of the color is, is it really burrows more deeply into the pool pavilions in particular. And here you can see how we're using a tile mosaic similar to what you saw in one of the earlier projects. It gets brighter toward the entry areas where the most natural light is coming in. So as you move more deeply into these pavilions, they become more colorful. These are the stalls for showers and toilets. So it gets more dark, more deep purple in this particular case, and then it gets brighter again as you move up and out to, toward the pool, which you can see here in plan, uh, and finally an elevation. So the purple is kind of working its way out into the ceiling and then as you're moving out to the pool. And this gives you some sense, you can see the two stairs here, of how that view will look. The pavilion will be right here. Um, I just wanted to end, this is a video of the storefront um, of our office, um, by starting by saying thanks for coming out and listening to me speak tonight. I hope um, the lecture was useful. But I think in terms of these two subjects, mass production and mass media, I think for Clover and I, it's no longer what I'm trying to demonstrate in this lecture is there's a lot of people playing with this equipment, playing with media in architecture, but I think it's, it's really important that, you, that as designers we're not foregrounding the technology or the media itself, but we're always coming back to how that produces specific types of architectural effects. So we use tons of parametric modeling, lots of digital software, we don't talk about that in terms of the work. We're talking about massing and how that's dealing with ideas that pertain to architecture and the discourse, which is also how we've tried to frame how we work with media and graphical systems. To us, I guess what's most important is that there are ways that we're ex that as designers we're exploring a number of these technologies and always looking for new ways that they can impact uh, the design, which for us is you know, this is just a sketch of how that might work, and I hope that Clover and I will con continue to be as ambitious and um, exploratory as we have been um, since we've been uh, in Hong Kong and working together. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dave. That was fantastic. Do you have uh, energy for questions? Sure. Okay. You saw the, the projects and from the, the work uh, as a designer and architect. But uh, uh, I would like also to know the concerns of uh, psychology, for example, for the, this last uh, project. <coughs> you have to work with some buildings that have already been designed. Mm -hmm. uh, the concern that uh, you and whoever had uh, with uh, that. Uh, I don't know if I sure. Yeah, I understand. No, it's a it's a great it's a great question, and I didn't talk about it, but I can certainly talk about it. Um, a lot of the a lot of the role of what the pavilions are doing in this project is, in a sense, it's almost like a baseball cap. It's to kind of block out uh, the towers that are above and keep you focused, in a sense, in the world of the landscape. Below. That's one role that it has to serve, which is when you're moving around through the landscape, um, the, the scale of the towers is so large, a lot of what we've tried to do with the landscape architect is develop other areas in the landscape that become more intimately scaled that allow you to want to use it for long periods of time, um, as opposed to constantly being berated with the repetition of the towers, which may alienate uh, a lot of people from using those spaces. So all the pavilions are unique. They address different scales. They have different ideas about views, and that's how we've started to think about that and how we're trying to address that. The other part of it, of course, is, the, is how you see those pavilions and the landscape from your apartment. 
um, which is a much more traditional way that landscape is understood in Chinese developments, which is almost like a graphic, like a carpet that I'm looking down on from my unit. Uh, and so the, the color idea, the fact that you can't see the color from the unit, but that it's only through exploring the site that you might discover the color of pavilions, but you may have hints of it from the view of your unit is a way to think through that problem a little bit more three-dimensionally so that you're, you're kind of constantly engaging both worlds a little bit more robustly um, rather than being able to really fully understand the landscape from above. So it kind of tries to entice you in other more mysterious ways. And the way the color projects on the ground is, is how we're, we're exploring that right now. That's one of the ways we're exploring that. The oculi also in them allow light to emerge from the garage. You will see people in some of them at times. So there are ways that you get glimpses into, almost like windows within windows from your apartment as you look down into them. Yes, I would like also to ask you some questions. one question. When I was seeing your, your work and this kind of very detailed approach to each one of the, of the buildings, I was wondering what about your, your mindset while working in Hong Kong or in China or in the States? So how will that change somehow the way you work with materials or the way you work with the, with the program? So how will the local affect your, your mindset? Sure. That's a great question. I mean, we moved to Hong Kong because we were interested in the Delta and its background in terms of manufacturing. But one thing that I think it's made us realize is models are more powerful than drawings. That would be the simplest way I could put it. Models, prototypes, and spending time on site is much more effective than drawings in China. Uh, people will look at renderings and they'll just try to build it from that. But uh, why we prototype and model a lot and make models like the like the even the the stop action animation that we made of the models for the pavilions for this is so that we can engage in a conversation with the develop developers to get them involved in the process of design and start giving us feedback very early on in terms of how we're working through things if we don't do that we're designing we're designing details that they're not going to be able to build we're designing stuff that you could build in Europe or the States that we wouldn't necessarily, uh, I'm not sure we would know how to do that in Europe or the States. Of course, it's always a feedback loop and every architect goes through a phase of trying to learn from their contractors and the people who are building their projects to learn from them. But I think models are a great way to interact with those people and develop a design process together and develop the project together. And it opens up other opportunities. It may shut down certain opportunities, but it opens up other things. So while certain ideas may have to be simplified or m more rudimentary, there are other things that, that we've been able, that they're willing to experiment with that we have not found in the States. Um, so there's a level, I mean, I, I guess another generalization I could make is that there's a level of willingness to, to experiment and play, both in mainland China and in Hong Kong, that you would never find in the States. The people wouldn't be brave, brave or naive enough to try to build that, whereas they would here. They just may build it wrong. <laughs> so, so you have to be, uh, you have to do, give them as many different kinds of representations as possible, and interact with them often and early on, in order to develop that. I think that's more challenging in mainland China. What's interesting about this project, and I think it's a unique model, and I have a lot of friends who are building all over mainland China, as we're doing 20, they asked us to do 100% DD on this project and 25% design development, that is, and 25% construction administration. I think clients here are maturing in mainland and they want architects to be more involved. They also don't want them flying in across a continent to come in because they know they can get better quality and they can do more things if people are more involved in the process and working with the local design institute more intimately. Um, a lot of my friends only do 50% design development and no, no construction administration. And then you have no idea what you're getting at all. We'll see whether or not that, this is the first project that we're doing in mainland China, so we'll see whether or not that, that proves useful. But the models and the drawings and the 
amount of time that we've spent with them so far seems to be helpful in terms of get, giving them the courage to try to do things, work with wood, which they had not done before, um, and things of that nature, which are very common for us, but things that uh, clients in China are just beginning to experiment with. Yeah? So you show us your work on interior spaces and exterior spaces. Uh, from zero or how you work on projects and all. But I would like to focus on just one type of your project, which is when you try to pull the landscape into your building or into your design. I always wonder, when you do something like that, we have different types, I would say we have two types of building. When you try to make your building or uh, your construction match with the landscape or work with the landscape, or when you make your building create and an original or something or a sensation, something different. So when you work on pulling the landscape into your construction, what is your concept of when the landscape changes? Because when you work with light, light to its internal, you still have light. When you work on that aspect, that's fine. But about the river, the trees and the weather and all those stuff, what if it changes? Well, we're trying to make it more artificial. We're not bringing it to the inside. We're actually trying to conceptually interiorize it. And there's a difference between the terms inside and interior. We're trying to make it quite different and more artificial on the interior. That doesn't mean that it is doesn't work with natural systems of growth. But to some extent, ecologies in and of their nature are artificial to begin with. If you look at Gregory Bateson's term, it's about how you interact with your environment. So it already has a synthetic component to deal with it. So we're very critical of working with systems naturally. I guess we don't believe that there are that there are systems that just exist in a purely natural state uh, any longer, at least. And it's interesting, even with light in Rome, if you look at Borromini or Bernini's work, it makes light look almost like it's artificial lighting at moments. It almost looks like a light bulb's on, even though they're working with natural light. That idea of getting the artificial and the natural to kind of vibrate at one moment, there, there's a very long history to that idea as a Baroque effect that deals with a certain worldview about design and architecture and how you build culture. And the general thinking of it is, is that, that that moment when you have those two things, you can't really distinguish between the two. It engages you more because you can't tell what it is. It produces a sense of mysteriousness about it. That's the way it's traditionally spoken about. Um, so I, for us, we're not worried at all about making it artificial. We're not trying to grow trees necessarily inside. In Butterfly House, none of the actual physical landscapes comes to the interior. It's about, but it is about interiorizing the landscape, as you said, making the site feel almost as if it's generated by the building. Um, and that's, a, that's different than blending it in with its surroundings. And uh, I guess what is interesting about that is it, to us, is it makes you interact with the landscape in very different ways and it allows you to, to discover it in other ways. But it, it definitely embraces ideas of illusion and fantasy, which are tied to landscape design and landscape architecture. Uh, in very specific ways and works architecturally with it in very, very artificial and synthetic ways. We're not trying to restore it. Uh, uh, I don't know if, do you know West 8? The landscape architects, West 8? They're, they're a famous Dutch firm, but Adrian Heuze and I were having a conversation at one point and he grew up in the Netherlands and they do huge projects in the Netherlands and he basically said which I found quite interesting, is that, you know, growing up, if you grow up in the Netherlands, you're constantly fighting water, fighting being flooded, right? And so landscape designers in Europe, landscape architects in Europe, tend to think about a site as only something artificial. They just have to make it better than what it was before. But whatever they're going in to do, they're reconstructing the whole site. It's an artificial act to begin with. And that is how they understand the term ecology. As opposed to, in the States, there's almost two branches. One is ecology 
as preservation of the original landscape, and then there's ecology in the more European sense of it. And I think that's a debate to be had. Um, you can argue, I think, quite clearly that there's very little actual real estate, for instance, in the U.S. or probably mainland China that's not managed ecologically in some way. It's part of a watershed that's managed by dams, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a high degree of, of artificiality to the world around us already. It's a question for us, for Clover and I, in terms of how do you turn that into a design feature? How do you start making that, producing other kinds of experiences that allows people to interact with their landscape in different ways? Um, does that answer your question? Okay, I suggest we uh, open the drinks, and uh, those of you who want to continue asking great questions can do so in a more informal way. Over the drink at the back of the